Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh In this discussion, we will discuss about an overview of labor economics So, I have explained the course outline and give you the structure of the course in the earlier video For our class here, the following is the Twitter hashtag that you can use if you want to tweet anything related to this course and also I have my YouTube channel Sanaha where I share almost all of my lecture videos on this channel please subscribe don't forget to give your thumbs up and comments so about my expectation I hope you can study hard for this course this is a unique environment of how we undertake our teaching and learning if you have any issues please inform me through email or the telegram channel or even the stream on our google classroom so let's start the discussion to understand the structure of labor economics i have explained earlier based on the course outline what are the things discussed under labor economics specifically using the textbook the Ehrenberg and Robert textbook and how I will pick certain chapters to discuss about the discipline over here these are some other discussions that you will find very common in labor economics and I'm sharing you this so that you can have better ideas when you want to choose your topic for the assignment labor economics is a study about how labor market works and this discipline involves many studies to understand the determinants of income distribution in the economy what explains widening income gap what explain the income inequality in a certain country this is among other common topics under this branch of economic discipline so there is also the study about unions if we have time i will bring in the discussion about union labor economics also looks into the study about how workers allocate their time between work and leisure for example if you decide to join the labor market how many hours are you ready to allocate for work so that's another important discussion in the labor economics next there is also a discussion about hiring and firing or laying off decision of firms what would make the employer to lay off workers there is also theories that explain the decision here so this is also things that we will discover in this wide ranging topics under labor economics labor market discrimination this is another common topic for example discrimination based on gender ethnicity maybe religion there are many other forms of discrimination that can take in the job market this is also another possible topic for you to explore the next topic common under labor economics is studies about the determinants of unemployment what explain youth unemployment how far the covid-19 pandemic has affected the level of unemployment in the economy these are some of the topics that you can explore and over here the last point for this slide is the topic about the investment in human capital so these are common in labor economics we participate in labor market by we it can mean workers and firms who are the workers workers can be households households if you can recall the circular flow diagram for the resource market or input market households become the resource providers and in this context households would provide their skills and knowledge in the labor market firms will be 
the bias of the inputs and in this context when firms hire workers this is how firms are buying the resources so over here we can see the common interaction between workers and firms and the exchange in the labor market basically is restricted by the rules and regulation set by the government government also plays a major role very influential roles in the labor economy or labor market because when government sets certain rules and regulations such as rules about minimum wage requirement or rules about quota in certain jobs rules about working hours and many other forms of rules that the government can put in place this definitely would affect the labor market therefore in this discipline there are established theories we can also collect data and establish certain facts related to the trend in the labor economy for example and there are also things that is very real to our life real world phenomena real world issues that we need to address when it's come to the interests of the workers for example under the pandemic crisis now unemployment because of the closure of many businesses is affecting many workers so that's a real world problems that merit attention by policy makers and many parties concerned about the welfare of workers so when we study labor economics it is very close to social policy issues the following describes the actors in the labor economics uh, workers households as i mentioned earlier provide our skills and knowledge to the firms firms then would hire our skills and knowledge and pay us as workers therefore when we say workers the objective of workers is to maximize his or her well-being then firms who are the employers who will hire the workers they have this objective which is to maximize profits hiring workers would mean that firms now are incurring costs and in many cases especially when the firm is using labor intensive production process the cost of hiring workers or labors is big as the proportion of the total cost so therefore firms need to look at how they can minimize the cost of workers that's in pursuant to maximize the profits the third actor in the labor market as i mentioned earlier is the government where government set the rules of the games in the economy in the labor market such as tax salary and many other policies to the concern of firms and workers when we study labor economics there are many dimensions that we can look at certain issue for example you can pick certain topic let's say the issue of child labor we can look at the issue of child labor from the international labor market perspective the global perspective of how unesco for example how united nation wants to address the issue of child labor certain countries are known to have high proportion of child labor this is one dimension it can be an international issue the second dimension is when we zoom in further to specific national level so we can look at issues in labor economics from the national labor market perspective child labor for example we can zoom in into certain country like india pakistan bangladesh these are known countries to have high proportion of child labor so we can look at the national 
aspect of the discussion. That's number two, the second dimension. And then we can even go or zoom in further to a more local context. You can go to Indian context, for example, at that national level, and you can pick certain district and study specific issues about child labor in that context, for example. So this is one way how we can look at the discussion of certain issues. You can be very broad. You can also zoom in into specific local context of the discussion. Definitely, different types of dimensions require certain different set of data. All right. So later, when you do your assignment, please take note of these different dimensions of the discussion. When we go into a much more localized context of the discussion, when we look at labor issue in terms of what's going on in a particular firm, this term, for example, we call it as external hiring or internal hiring process will come into the picture. The external hiring is used primarily for entry level jobs, while the higher level hiring or positions are allocated by the promotion from within the firms. So this would involve the internal hiring process. This is very common in many big organizations. When there is a vacancy at a much higher position, firms sometimes would advertise that within that organization. And this is what we call as the internal hiring process. The advantage of the internal hiring process is as follows. Number one is to reduce the hiring and training costs. If the firm were to hire external parties, this require more training, therefore more costs would involve in that process. Number two, internal hiring also is advantageous to the firm in terms of boosting the employees' morale and motivation. Now, workers or employees in that particular firm realize that there are opportunities for them to move or climb the corporate ladder or the organizational structure. This would motivate workers in that context. Number three, internal hiring also would reduce the effects of uncertainty uncertainty to the firms in terms of the quality of the external hiring. And this is also would reduce uncertainty among the workers about their future prospect when they work in that particular organization. This is another aspect of labor market that is very, very focused and localized. Sometimes the discussion can be further detailed in different costs such as organizational behavior or human resource management costs. Labor force, the concept of labor force refers to the non-institutionalized individuals age 16 or above who are either working or actively seeking jobs. So this is what we define as the labor force. And then we also have unemployed categories. This refers to those who are not working, but are actively seeking work. By actively seeking work is how when the labor market survey is conducted, how the respondent answered to one specific question. For example, the question may ask, if you answer that you are unemployed, then the next level of question would ask, are you actively seeking job in the last two weeks? So if you say yes, therefore you are considered as actively seeking job. If you say no, I am not actively seeking job for the last two weeks, then you will fall in the category of not in the labor force. So that's very sensitive to the survey. There is also additional term here, but this is not very common in the literature. For example, we call it as primary labor market, referring to high wages and 
stable employment relationship. Then we have the secondary labor market referring to those with low wages and unstable employment relationships. So you can think about examples of this. For example, in which category you want to put the e-hailing drivers? Or in which category you want to put lecturers who work in a public university? Therefore, the two terms here would enable us to categorize workers according to their salary and stability of the employment. Next, let's go further to some other terminologies important to this topic. The first one here is how to calculate unemployment rates. Unemployment rate is given by the number of people who are unemployed in the labor market. We have defined who are the unemployed category earlier and then we will divide with the number in the labor force. So this is how we compute the unemployment rate. Another important formula is how to calculate the employment rate. Employment rate is given by the number of workers who are employed. So I just write employed here. Divide by the number of working age population. Not the entire population. We divide with the number of the working age population. So these two formula, they are very distinct, but often confused by many people. Don't mistaken thinking that if you have the unemployment rate figure, you can just take one minus the unemployment rate. Therefore, this will give you the employment rate. This is the common understanding. This is wrong. Why you cannot have this arithmetic? Because we are not dividing this calculation, unemployment rate and employment rate with the same denominator. The denominator are different. Common mistake by student is when they want to calculate employment rate, they take number of those employed divided by labor force. That's very common mistake. So be careful about that. I have here examples of the way how we can look at the context of labor market and you can get more updated figures for this. The main purpose for you to realize the importance of understanding the terminologies used in labor economics. For example, in this box, we have population and this population refers to the working age population from the age of 16 and over. And this is in the context of the United States. We don't include total population, but this is just the working age population. And from this working age population, we divide them into two categories, labor force, employed, plus unemployed, but those unemployed must be still actively seeking jobs. And then the second category is those not in the labor force. And these arrows show another possible flows between those in the labor force category. They can move to not in the labor force category and vice versa. We have new entrants, re-entrants, also dropouts and also retirements. Later, when we come to the topic on unemployment, we will revisit this diagram and we will study further the direction of each of these arrows over here. But as of now, we only want to focus on the terms used in the boxes here. Going to labor force, we can divide labor force into two categories, those who are employed and those who are unemployed. And those unemployed, but they are looking for jobs or waiting for recruitment. 
or recalling into jobs. So this is another two categories under the labor force. Again, when we want to calculate unemployment rate, you see unemployment rate is given by the number of people unemployed divided by labor force. On the other hand, when we want to calculate employment rate, we take number of those people employed divided by working age population. You see the denominator used are different. The same terminologies are used, but over here, it is in the context of Malaysia. Again, you can find a much more updated figures from the Department of Statistics Malaysia. Labor force participation rate is given by this formula. Labor force participation rate is equal to the number of people in the labor force divided by the working age population. This is the formula on how to calculate the labor force participation rate. Therefore, in this diagram, you can see that we can calculate the labor force participation rate according to different categories. For example, you can calculate the total labor force participation rate over here total or you can also look at labor force participation rate according to male or female. By the way, on the left side diagram here, this is for Q2 2017, while over here, the right side diagram is for Q3 2017. If you want to calculate the labor force, you can calculate the total labor force, labor force participation rate, for the total population, you take the labor force divided by the working age population. But if you are interested to know the labor force participation rate for female, let's write subscript F there for female, then you will take the labor force of female in the economy, female who are in the category of labor force, divided by the working age population, I think I write for population of female, working age population of female. This is how we calculate the labor force participation for female. And therefore, we can establish the same in the context of labor force participation rate for male, given by the labor force of male in the economy divided by the working age population of male. So this is how we get to the calculation. Basically, this is the same information as previously in a different way of presentation. Now we look at quarter three 2017 over here, we find that the labor force participation rate of male in Malaysia is about 61.8% in contrast the labor force participation rate for female in Malaysia Q3 2017 is just 38.4% that means there are many working age female who are not yet in the labor force category so we need to understand why many working age female are not joining the labor force? That's an important research question that we need to find out the answer. Over here, another way how we can extend our understanding when we know the formula to calculate the labor force participation rate is to figure out the figures according to the educational level. How you calculate the labor force participation rate of those with the tertiary qualification? For example, how do the statisticians get 65.1% of the labor force participation rate in Malaysia, those with the tertiary qualification in 2012? So we want to know the formula. It is given by the labor force numbers 
of workers with tertiary qualification divided by the working age population of workers with the tertiary qualification so this is the formula that we used to get to this number and i hope you understand the rest on how we can derive the other figures this is just another statistic you can observe in many statistical report related to the labor market we talk about labor force participation rate and the formula to calculate labor force participation rate we even go further into how to derive specific labor force participation rate according to certain category that we want to know more about it like female or according to education level and so on just to extend further that understanding let's say you want to know the labor force participation rate of female with the jury qualification so that's what you want to get labor force of female with the jury qualification if you want to get this you need the information about the number of labor force who are female with tertiary qualification and you need to divide that with the working age population of female with tertiary qualification so this is how you can derive the labor distinct special rate of female with tertiary qualification moving on in this slide it is also important for us to know about the concept of nominal wage and real wage as workers when workers receive their salaries or wages to economists we are interested more on the real wage real wage is given by nominal wage divided by the price index so that will give you the real wage the following are some other important terminologies i think many people keep interchangeably using these terminologies without realizing that each of them carries different meaning for example when we say wage this refers to payment per unit of time usually wage per hour wage per day that's very common and when we say earnings this refers to the wage rate time the hours work that's give you the earnings and then total compensation is equal to earnings plus fringe benefits and this fringe benefits is equal to payment in payment in kind and also deferred compensation such as your epf is deferred you will receive later the last one is income it is given by total compensation plus unearned income an income refers to income that we get from other than our main employment such as from dividends rentals and so on we can look at this diagram because it shows us clearly how each of these terminology refers to different meaning i mentioned earlier which rate this refers to pay per unit of time such as which rate per hour 8 ringgit per hour for example times how many hours that particular worker works unit of time work that will give us earnings earnings plus employment benefits whether in kind or deferred payment that's give us total compensation and then total compensation plus unearned income such as interest income this is haram from in the islamic perspective dividends government transfer payments rentals and many other sources of unearned income then that's give us the total income of that worker so please take note of these terminologies I think that's all that I want to cover in this session. Please note that in this discussion we have discussed various aspects of labor economics, the actors in the labor market, 
and key terminologies that you will find very common in the discussion. Insha'Allah, I'll see you again in another discussion. Thank you. Wassalam.